These children are part of a special summer program at Holy Trinity in Chicago. A preferred model of education by the deaf community, this class assimilates children with and without hearing impairments. Why? Who, rem who remembers? Why is Vicky, Venetia's sister, going to the hospital? What for? This mode of education called inclusion has stimulated much debate on how we should educate our young in America. Nope. Nope. Who wants to start off on the issue? Dr. Quentin Young, a noted physician and advocate for public health, moderates a panel of former students, parents, advocates, and professionals as they discuss issues related to inclusion. Accessibility, I think when we talk about that, we have to, we have to think of it in a very, very... My name is Charlotte Desjardins, and I'm with the Family Resource Center on Disabilities. We provide information and training on special education rights, as well as rights under the Rehabilitation Act. We also provide family support and transition services. My name is Matt Cohen. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Monaghan and Cohen here in Chicago. We represent children and families in disputes with the public schools surrounding special education issues. Hi, I'm Bev Johns, and I chair ISELA, the Statewide Special Education Coalition. I also have the fortune to work as a practitioner in the field and have worked in the field for 25 years, supervising programs for children with learning disabilities and behavior disorders, and also supervising an alternative school for children with severe behavior problems known as the Garrison Alternative School. Dr. Alejandro Benavides, superintendent of the Illinois the Illinois Center for Rehabilitation and Education. I'm also on the board of directors for Illinois Fiesta Educativa. They're an agency that advocates for Latinos with disabilities and their families. I'm Bob Henderson, a professor of special education and educational administration at the University of Illinois in Urbana. My name is Kate Kibbe. I'm an I'm Sharon Fragan from Northern Illinois University and I'm most closely associated with the preparation of teachers to work with children and youth who have severe intellectual disabilities and multiple handicaps and I'm very involved with families throughout the state of Illinois as they are trying to achieve the least restrictive environment for their children. My name is Kathleen Rose Winter and I'm from the Chicago Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. I'm a person with a disability. I was born with my disability and therefore I was a child with a disability educated in the Chicago Public Schools. I've been an advocate for children with disabilities and people with disabilities and family with disabilities for the past 15 to 20 years. My name is Jim McGovern. I'm a surrogate parent uh, for uh, the Illinois State Board of Education. I'm with the Council for Disability Rights also. Uh, surrogate parent is one who advocates for children who are wards of the state whose parents cannot be located. Um, I am a person with a disability. Uh, I was born with my disability and went through the Chicago Public Schools as a student with a disability and I have a daughter who uh, also has a disability. Hello, I'm Linda Schaefer. I provide special education advocacy services to parents who are having difficulties with the special education process. I'm also the parent of a child who is now a young adult with a disability. And I'm Quentin Young of the Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. Greetings. Before this panel mix it up, I'm going to ask Jim McGovern to give us a background on the topic we're addressing today. Thank you. Um, in 1975, Congress passed uh, the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act, which is commonly known to most of us back then as Public Law 94142. Uh, there are provisions in that act to ensure that all children with disabilities, regardless of the nature and degree of the disability, receive a free, appropriate public education. And to ensure that, Congress has mandated that parents be equal partners in the process of educating their child with a disability, that each child have an IEP, which is an individualized education plan tailored to meet the needs of that child, that the child will be educated in the least restrictive environment, 
and that if there is a dispute between parents and the district, that there are procedural safeguards such as administrative due process hearings that the parent or the district have the right to initiate. Uh, through the years, there have since the, the passage of the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act, there have been a number of issues that have arisen. Uh, hopefully this evening we'll be discussing some of those issues. One of them, which is uh, a topic which is in the spotlight right now, is inclusion. And hopefully we will be touching on that this evening. And with that, Dr. Young, uh, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's clear there's a lot of uh, controversy, despite the obvious commitment to the Congress to uh, the educational problems of those with disabilities. Let's take the one you highlighted, inclusion versus separateness. Would anybody here tell us what the, how it looks to you? How would you state the problem of inclusion versus separateness, whether you have the, the, the clients in the common classroom with non-disabled people or separate? I'd like to hear somebody tackle that one. Matt? I'd be happy to. The uh, first issue is one of what we're talking about. And when Congress passed the law, as Jim indicated, in 1975, they mandated that children be served in the least restrictive environment. Many children who were given labels uh, with various disabilities ended up being served in self-contained classrooms, uh, separate schools, or even private schools. And the law has a very clear decision-making process. And that decision-making process requires that schools look at the child's ability to have success in the regular education environment before even considering the child being moved into some other setting. And if it's determined that the child cannot function successfully within the regular education environment without support, then the law obligates the schools to consider what supports might be provided to the child in order to allow them to participate successfully within the regular education environment. The law has been very successful in bringing children into education. When the law was passed, some children with disabilities weren't receiving any education at all. It is less clear, in fact, I think it is clear that the law has not been as successful in assuring that children are served in the least restrictive environment. And what is happening in many situations with children with disabilities is that by virtue of their label, by virtue of administrative convenience, by virtue of absence of resources or lack of commitment, children are placed in a setting that involves a concentration of children with disabilities because it is more economical or efficient to do so rather than because the school district has gone through this decision-making process that I described. Well, it sounds like an indictment. Let's see if we can get some answers from some of the panelists who are dealing with it. Alejandro, I have to believe this is part of your responsibility, not what he cl complained about, but you have to oversee this process. Am I accurate in that? Yes, well right now it's, um, it is a facility that is a little different than a, than a private, or I'm sorry, than a public school. Let me talk about my public school experience. And both as an educator and uh, an administrator, and pretty much concur that that is, that is the situation. Uh, from a teacher and administrator, that's something that quite a few years ago you just accepted. What, what are the problems you see? What can we do? I think as we discuss the issue of inclusion, there are a lot of definitions of what it is. One of the issues that has come to the forefront, however, is a concept known as full inclusion. And that is where a philosophy where all children are in the regular classroom. And perhaps that has sparked uh, some of the debate uh, because there are those of us who, who really believe that what one needs to focus on, the individual needs of each child. And we need to create more options for children rather than less options. And there are those sometimes who are advocating full inclusion, which would be all children in the regular classroom, uh, which would then advocate uh, a removal of some of the options. And what some of us are trying to do is say that, yes, regular classroom is a, is a very, very important option for a child, but at the same time, we need to create a whole range of options so that truly children's individual needs are met. I understand that uh, the hearing impaired, by and large, prefer not to be included. Could you explain that to us and how it works out in real life? Yes, it is true because um, the situation while the teacher can be able to communicate in sign language, 
crying and the rug was cracked and the teeth the dust and found to the style. And there are limited numbers of interpreters sitting in the classroom and the fear factor is different from another side. Uh, the communication is really important in the sub community. So we really need to have the sub contained chat. So everyone in Microsoft can be able to learn in that language and to communicate at that level. I agree with uh, what Kate was saying about um, people need to um, it, the hearing impaired community, there's a culture there and they need to be educated in an environment that's comfortable for them. But why not hire hearing impaired teachers? Why can't hearing impaired teachers teach hearing students and uh, uh, hearing impaired students or hard of hearing students? I think we need to look at this as an issue of, of our culture, of our society. Schools reflect our society. If we're discussing whether or not a child should be excluded, because that's what we're talking about too, because of something, some difference or some perceived difference in them, we have to uh, discuss why, we have to understand why we're discussing that. Do you uh, agree with that? Or? Well, I agree with um, yeah. Kathleen and, and Matt. Obviously, people that, that know me would um, uh, clearly understand that. I have um, been perhaps on the forefront of what's been um, inclusion in the state of Illinois. And in, in trying to understand this, um, in 1992, the ARC, the Association for Retarded Citizens USA, conducted a study of uh, inclusion across the United States. And we in Illinois had a ranking of 49th in the nation. That's our usual only, ranking. <laughs> right, right, in, in a number of things, isn't it? Yes, and um, only New Jersey was behind us in that. In, in addition to having that 49th ranking and receiving an F, we were put into the Hall of Shame mm. along with um, four other states. Um, in trying to understand this, because I've been in Illinois a long time and a citizen, I, I've been, and I worked with many, many good people. Uh, majority of the citizens in Illinois I find to be uh, very caring. Um, people and I don't like to get into arguments with teachers that I think are very good and have the best interest of um, children at heart. So in trying to look at this I think what happened is Illinois actually was providing services before 94-142 was to be implemented and they were one of the states if not the state to have the most services for the broadest range of students with disabilities. When the law came along, I think what we tried to do in Illinois was overlay what we already had on top of what the law was saying. Congress's intent was not just should it be in the least restrictive environment, it was non-removal was their intent. If you look at what Senator Humphrey said, what Congressman Miller said, what Senator Stafford said, it was clearly non-removal and you were to try every single child in their home school, in the general education environment, and that should be done with supports and aids sufficient to meet their needs. Um, a, a big part of the law also that is talked about, that's, that's never really talked about, is to the maximum extent appropriate children are to interact on a daily basis with their peers who are non-disabled. And even children in institutions are to have that opportunity. And I don't, but when you rank 49th in the nation and we wholesale segregate, wholesale segregate children based on a label, based on a funding formula, based on teacher certification, we can take also, it's systemic segregation.